Okay, let's just get started. My name is Professor Richard Burke, and um, first of all, I'd like to welcome you all to what is now the 10th annual uh, Nikolai Rubinstein Lecture on the History of Political Thought and Intellectual History. It's particularly pleasing to have Professor Samuel Moyne uh, with us to see this evening to deliver this year's lecture. Samuel Moyne is currently Professor of Law and Professor of History at Yale University. He took his PhD in European History at the University of California, Berkeley, as well as law degree at uh, Harvard University. He spent over a decade at Columbia University, ultimately becoming James Bryce Professor of European Legal History there, and then moved to Harvard University as Jeremiah Smith Jr. Professor of Law and Professor of History before settling, if he has settled, um, at, the, at Yale University. Much of Samuel Moyne's work has been at the intersection of intellectual history and the history of law, particularly the history of human rights. His first book was a study of the French Lithuanian Jewish philosopher, Emmanuel Levinas. Since then, he's written on a range of subjects, including French intellectual history, just, just find a seat and, um, and you're done, including uh, um, French intellectual history, for example, uh, the work of Claude Lefort and François Furet and uh, Pierre Ronsavalon, um, on Jewish thought and experience, on uh, global intellectual history, and a series of learned and provocative books on the history and really philosophy of human rights. For example, The Last Utopia in 2010, and Not Enough Human Rights in an Unequal World, which is due to appear in, I think, a couple of months' time. So over the past decade or so, Samuel Moyne has been an engaging and sometimes polemical presence in North American intellectual life. He's also been a highly original academic figure, responsible for establishing really entirely new uh, agendas, as well as injecting um, older debates with um, what we can call new life. So it goes without saying that we're delighted to have him here to talk to us this evening. His lecture is titled uh, Judith Schlar's Critique of Cold War Liberalism. And so without any more ado, I'm going to hand it over to Sam to deliver the lecture. Cheers. All right, well, thank you to Richard, and uh, thanks also to Mira Siegelberg in absentia. She, she tendered the original invitation. So I can't tell you what an honor it is to deliver this lecture. Uh, this year, it's taking place at um, a moment of the crisis of liberal democracy. Now, I want to hasten to add that uh, this crisis is not one of its imminent collapse. Uh, it, uh, it, the crisis may subside, at, at any rate, in places that aren't already close to or over the brink, like Eastern Europe. Um, and it may distort our agenda to claim in, in a country like mine that tyranny is looming. Uh, and when it comes to this country, uh, one famous historian of political thought uh, has represented the Brexit vote as a blow for liberal democracy, or at least democracy. Nobody can predict whether uh, this increasing sense of crisis will continue. If it does, I believe that more and more people, especially young people, will find themselves driven to a familiar and fateful choice whether to abandon liberalism as lost or to propose to reinvent it. Now, there's no such thing, of course, as a stable liberal tradition in the history of political thought, and that has come into being uh, and found itself canonized through a process of serial reinvention. What I'll propose tonight is that assuming something better than liberalism can offer us isn't necessary after all. Our next move uh, in the liberal tradition will have to be to save it from its Cold War legacies. And in quest of that agenda, I'll look for some initial help, that's all, uh, and orientation to an unfamiliar source, one of the central exponents of Cold War liberalism itself. And I have in mind, of course, the Judish Sklar. Uh, 
it will turn out that Schlar isn't just a premier Cold War liberal, but a critic of the tradition to which she's often assigned. Now, like others of this school, such as Raymond Aron, Isaiah Berlin, Karl Popper, and Jacob Talmon, Schlar came in her career to place the fear of tyranny, the threat of the collapse of freedom, at the center of her thought for the cruel violations such a result might entail. And like the other Cold War liberals, she hewed to a pessimistic enlightenment after the desolation of total war, the tragedy of the Holocaust, and the scandal of totalitarianism, orienting herself to the standing threat of the violent end of pluralism. The nub of Schlar's approach was what she called rather early in her career the liberalism of permanent minorities. Uh, and it was to be institutionalized in defense of such pluralism. Unillusioned about the permanence of evil and shaken by the memory of horror, this liberalism of fear, as she most famously called it, dropped any radical expectations of improvement in order to theorize in the presence of the summum malum in politics. Now, everyone acquainted with Schlar's thought, even just a little, can recognize her in this routine presentation, and rightly so. And yet, it misses something important and perhaps essential. Schlar's first book, called After Utopia, The Decline of Political Faith, saw an alternative to Cold War liberalism. Now, Cold War liberalism, in retrospect, was a strange formation. It emerged at the time of an unprecedented ex expansion of the liberal state. It left no theorists of serious note in the canon who explained that state, the welfare state, stirring attempt to institutionalize freedom and equality like none before, however flawed and truncated its agenda looks now, and however much it would stand not just in need of rehabilitation, but also of reinvention. In the face of a totalitarian enemy, so-called, that purported in the Soviet Union to stand in the vanguard of progress, actually Schlar's doctoral advisor named Karl Friedrich had done much to popularize this notion of totalitarianism. Liberal theory departed from liberal practice. Cold War liberals placed the hypertrophy of the state close to the core of its outlook than it did the powerful and redistributive welfareism that in fact emerged under Cold War liberalism's watch. In its theological versions, Cold War liberalism considered fallenness and sin, not opportunity and redemption, the heart of the human condition. And psychologically, including in secular forms like Schlar's, anxiety and fear not hope or possibility. Even though decolonization, again, in this same era, involved an unprecedented expansion uh, of the search for political freedom and social justice to the ends of the word Earth, Cold War liberalism also failed to think about the end of West European empire, except to worry that the same European deviations of modern despotism and tyranny that Cold War liberalism hated were now sweeping the global south. Now, understandable as this stance may have been in its own context, it's haunted liberal theory, I believe, since. Uh, and just as Schlar argued in the book I'm going to address for the sources of this stance even before the Cold War, so this bleak liberalism has lived into our own time, outlived, outlived its usefulness in our era. Indeed, Cold War liberalism has deeply affected progressives insofar as they've often taken a heavy dose of Cold War liberalism to heart since the end of the Cold War itself. Uh, it's thus of considerable importance, I think, that Schlar began her career as an incisive critic of this syndrome before going on to incarnate it herself. Now, she defended her Radcliffe dissertation in 1955 
under the title Fate and Futility, Two Themes in Contemporary Political Theory, in the Harvard Government Department, where she subsequently spent her career as an influential teacher. Aside from the lasting and a value of so many of its extraordinary and learned interpretations of the history of modern Euro European political theory, After Utopia, the book published two years later, deserves attention for opening a path that Schlar herself soon gave up uh, the attempt to blaze further. I'll try to show in my time that the book sought a return to a persuasive ideological politics in the spirit of enlightenment, retrieving optimism from the ruins of her present. It was most of all an anatomy of the wellsprings and limitations of a conservative approach to liberalism that she saw ascending to hegemony in her youth, including the economic neoliberalism that Schlar was one of the very first, though surely not the last, uh, to subject to critical ire. If that conservative liberalism triumphed even more thoroughly after the Cold War aside, alongside its companion neoliberalism, then Schlar's own defense of enlightenment becomes a source for us in the crisis to which both have led. Now, in an interview she gave before her death with Judith Walters, that's Michael's uh, wife, recorded uh, when Judith Walters surveyed the tiny number of tenured female professors at Harvard in 1981, Schlar described After Utopia as a work that she put everything I was into. I read day and night, she continued, every terrific book sitting in that little basement of Radcliffe Library gaining a second education. And it has to be said uh, that especially as a first venture for a political theorist, its erudition as, and range, as I think you'll have to acknowledge by the end of my presentation, are staggering. Schlar's argument required her not simply to return to the 18th century to give a reading of the Enlightenment and wade into the contested topic of how to define the Romantics' response to it, but also to offer short assessments of an amazing array of 19th century thinkers whose unfortunate heirs everyone in the 20th century still was, she thought. If I was going to argue that nobody could understand what was happening to us, she recalled, in conversation with Judith Walzer. It must have something to do with the kind of intellectual traditions we had inherited. So I want to spend the bulk of this recapitulating her own story of the history of political thought from the Enlightenment to the present to reach the all-important final act of the price that the Cold War exacted on its liberalism, and I will then suggest in conclusion on us still. On Schlar's definition, the Enlightenment was a post-Christian, neo-Stoic project to institutionalize universal reason, understood to be a plan for individuals and for society to make themselves rather than lean on supposedly external authority, whether in metaphysics or politics. The essence of radicalism she explained, is the idea that man can do with himself and his society whatever he wishes. The deprivation of the opportunity to do so individually or collectively was the definition of political wrongdoing. Basic survival wasn't good enough, and any defense of private heterogeneity that masked the oppression of tradition uh, was intolerable. Justice is the center of stoic thought, old and new, Schlar contended. To ridicule this preoccupation is easy enough. Whether anything superior has ever been considered is another matter. The Enlightenment, she thought, thus foregrounded the secular possibility of the assumption of practical agency to make and remake ourselves and, in connection, denounced obstructions to that just society uh, uh, in the balance. Now, her opening premise I think is shocking in view of what she became. Uh, the Enlightenment was not already concerned with the summum malum of violent outcomes, but she was concerned with the reverse, an Enlightenment vision of human emancipation and justice. Arguing that the fate of political theory is determined by the vicissitudes of radicalism, 
is how none other than the famed political theorist Sheldon Wolin described Schlar's Enlightenment baseline in a lengthy and, I think, forgotten contemporary essay on Schlar's book. It was as if the vicissitudes of political theory from Plato on were to be judged according to whether it anticipated and then realized the Enlightenment promise to allow human agency in a common world. Now, such a scheme undoubtedly depended on reading the Enlightenment in a certain way. Wolin rightly concluded that in setting up her baseline, Schlar made controversial strategic choices about how to represent early modern thought. In emphasizing radicalism, Schlar omitted precisely the features of the Enlightenment that she was later to make central to her liberalism of fear. The greatest exponents of liberalism, Wolin worried, in what reads like a highly ironic comment in retrospect, were more apt to dwell on the numerous threats of pain in the world than on the abundant possibilities of happiness. Yet, it was not Schlar's ambition to revive the early modern moral psychology uh, that put cruelty first. Neither of her later heroes in doing so, uh, uh, Michel de Montaigne or the Baron Montesquieu, rate so much as a single mention in Schlar's first book. Her problem was what had befallen an enlightenment centered on emancipation and justice. Her answer briefly was romanticism. Brutally summarizing, it had started with an aesthetic revolt and gone on to successfully insert an opposition between the individual and society uh, that the politics of enlightenment had never envisioned. What G.W.F. Hegel had called the unhappy consciousness stood for the alienation that romanticism emphasized and which soon burst beyond the need to stake out aesthetic individuality against the conformist masses and ripen into a full-fledged political theory. The unhappy consciousness, which Hegel claimed, as you know, to transcend, uh, nonetheless established a chief figure of mid and later 19th century intellectual history. Uh, in all of the depictions of Promethean creation in which it trafficked, not just in poetry, but in the alternative reassertions of art in the philosophies of Hegel's unfaithful sons, Soren Kierkegaard and Friedrich Nietzsche, with Schlar writing when it was still new to contemplate them in the canon of philosophy. Her real interest, however, was in the twofold topic of how this romanticism became political and how in the 20th century its original monetary criticism of organized society declined into what she called a romanticism of defeat that abjured all hope of reconciliation between the alienated individual and the politics of society. In the 19th century, romantics might have railed against bourgeois utilitarianism, but Kierkegaard and Nietzsche's uh, held out the prospects of leaps of faith and cultural revolutions. By the time of Nietzsche's Swiss Contemporary Jakob Burkhardt, however, a more fundamental pessimism had set in. Beauty in the past, ancient Greece and Renaissance Italy provided some consolation in the intolerable present. Uh, but history offered no prospect of more than diversion. And Schlar recorded, the more that Burkhardt lost himself in the past, the more he detested the present. It was a paralyzed defeatism that many 20th century romantics were to share. Insofar as there was a politics of the unpolitical, it could take the form of longing for aesthetic elites to transcend the mediocre rabble, obviously a prospect with which Nietzsche still flirted. But as time passed, it normally uh, assumed the guise of a complete separation from the mob in a stance of despair. At best, politics are futile, Borkhardt recorded. At worst, they interfere with culture. Like Kierkegaard, who despite his political conservatism had no truck with aestheticist elitism, Henri Bergson didn't uh, take his intuitionist romanticism in the direction of illiberal and undemocratic politics. Schlar, however, explained in her first published article, 1958, part of the same moment 
of After Utopia, uh, that uh, Bergson uh, had avoided some of the worst mistakes of his own heirs. Uh, but while they deserved a blame for their own mistake, Bergson's own appeal to ineffable intuition was nonetheless, like Borchardt's, a toxic politics of withdrawal. The climax of After Utopia uh, is what may remain, I believe is, the most comprehensive and masterful treatment of European political thought in the 1940s and 50s, especially for those interested in a broad existentialist moment in continental intellectual life. On Schlar's account, that moment merely took to an extreme of intensity the bereft futility to which Romanticism had driven its earlier votaries. In her survey, Schlar produced cutting readings of existentialism's German, French, and Spanish representative. And her ire uh, was coruscating whether existentialism was offered in religious Kierkegaardian key or a pagan Nietzschean one. In especially scintillating diagnoses of a mass of existentialist texts of her youth, Schlar examines how history once a forum of enlightenment opportunity had become opaque and terrifying to many thinkers, while society represented a nest of uniformity that romantics in their latter-day existentialist guise could only flee with the masses in the 20th century taking place of the Philistines of the 19th. Ethics was an undoubted topic for many existentialists. Uh, starting, however, from the premise of an abstract, officious uh, community that required individual flight and search for authentic uh, intersubjectivity. In a second step, based, she concluded, this is a reading of Martin Heidegger, on a loneliness that uh, uh, this new theory of intersubjectivity preserves. She also acknowledged that certain French existentialists, especially after World War II, turned their views to the support of communism. Uh, yet, even Sartre's glamorizing praise for the insurrectionary Maquis during the French resistance, in which Sartre was personally uninvolved, of course, mainly revealed that existentialists uh, projected sociality onto imaginary extreme situations which were simply unavailable in ordinary institutions. Schlar concluded, if there's such a thing as romantic political theory today, it consists in rejecting all historically possible forms of political life. Now, in her tour of Cold War European philosophy, Schlar was not done with the existentialist. She devoted another whole chapter to the Christian version of fatalism, which was a major a cultural phenomenon in her time. Since Joseph de Mestre, the Christian critique of enlightenment, she allowed, came by its pessimism more honestly. It was rooted in theological premises of sin, though it was highly important that Mestre, who had been, of course, an adherent of enlightenment, only moved to theological hatred on uh, the grounds of his political response to revolution. And Romanticism uh, struck Schlar uh, compared to Christianity as the greater threat, if only because its secular votaries both evacuated the radical potential of secular philosophy while also ending more bereft than any Christian uh, who believes in God could ever become. For Christian intellectuals, modern politics no longer looked open to reform, and 20th century experience merely proved symptomatic of grievous metaphysical impertinence. In response, a new era for Christendom would have to utterly transcend liberal error. As Schlar concluded chicly on this front, it seems rather easy for Christian writers to announce the end of our age, since, after all, it was never much to their liking to begin with. Now, uh, let me open a parenthesis uh, before uh, continuing my summary about a very grievous error that I think studying Schlar in the way I'm proposing helps uncover. Uh, that error is what the first Rubinstein lecturer, Professor Quentin Skinner, famously called the mythology of coherence. For writing about Schlar 
including by herself when she thought autobiographically late in her life, has always been strongly subject to the temptation to read her career as unified, but no life is. Schlar's exile experience, her peregrinations from Riga to Shanghai to Montreal to her Cambridge, Massachusetts professorship, and the Jewish background that forced her on her childhood journey are conventionally cited as the wellsprings of her thought, but this is a gross concession to stereotype. Not only was her Cold War liberalism not uh, the unique choice of exiles or Jews, but Schlar rejected it as her first move. The signature themes of atrocity, cruelty, or pluralism with which Schlar is today associated do not show up at all in After Utopia, and if anything, she's best read as offering a critique of making such themes central. Her overriding goal, instead, was to complain of the absence of optimism and liberalism and the victory of its conservative opponents within the walls of their ancient enemies. After Utopia reveals Schlar's posture as an exiled Jew to be much more a remarkable act of self-fashioning at a later date than it was a straightforward result of lived experience. It's striking in After Utopia that even when she castigated the overbreadth of the then popular notion of the West, Schlar herself affiliated with European civilization as our tradition, whose chief problems are one that fall on its heirs rather than on outsiders to correct. At times, she appears to be one of the last authors oriented not to atrocity and disaster to which liberal states uh, are uh, at in, in endemic risk, uh, but, uh, uh, and might require eternal vigilance for that reason, but instead uh, to the hope for increasing social freedom that the Enlightenment expressed in redefining the tradition of political theory. The Holocaust likely does receive an oblique reference as mass murder on the first page of the preface of the book, but as otherwise peripheral to the framing of the book's concern. Schlar's often grouped uh, mistakenly with Hannah Arendt uh, as fellow uh, uh, Jewish exiled women, uh, as if from this set of shared facts, a certain posture must follow. But uh, in fact, Schlar mentioned her alleged opposite number in After Utopia mainly to cast aspersions on Arendt's romantic assumptions that ruined her analysis of politics. Nor is the threat of broader social cruelty beyond atrocity central to Schlar's investigation of optimism's abandonment. What's central, as I now want to turn to show, is the syndrome of liberals taking on board conservatism and neoliberalism as their own doctrines. It's highly significant in this regard, as my iPhone evidence shows you, that in her original dissertation, Schlar made this uh, most central quandary visible by placing her critique of what had befallen liberalism at the start. Uh, of her book before she reorganized it. The end of radicalism, as she called it, meant the relinquishment of what she called the liberal belief that people can control and improve themselves and collectively their social environment. Schlar's tale of liberal self-destruction comes in two stages, with the invention of political conservatism after in response to the French Revolution infecting liberalism right away and the Enlightenment suffering a blow from which it was difficult to recover. Total war and totalitarianism in the 20th century only, in her words, completed the rout. What, uh, whether it was a reactionary demand for theocracy or a mild insistence on cautious reform, conservatism, Schlar insisted, had only been given specious unity as a strategy to resist Jacobinism. And yet this couldn't define it distinctively because soon liberalism came to join conservatism in this preoccupation. Liberalism, in her word, abandoned the Enlightenment because it came to seem plausible to defend limits to governmental authority 
and commitment to personal liberty in a fatalistic spirit born of hatred of Jacobin radicalism. This invention of what would become eventually Cold War liberalism hasn't been the work of one day, in Schlar's words. Rather, the premier 19th century liberals, other than J.S. Mill, abandoned Enlightenment anti-clericalism that had so often characterized French philosophes of the 18th century. With one eye on her own time, Schlar diagnosed a deeper abdication of the progressive role of intellectuals who, as she cited Alexis de Tocqueville, observing in the old regime in the French Revolution, no longer believed in themselves and were suspicious of the threats of unreformable and wayward majorities, the potential of which to decline into secular fanaticism indeed now had to be kept in check with once hated religious pieties. Obviously, a mill epitomized residual faith and education. But now, not for the sake of universal emancipation of individual and society to make themselves, but rather to counteract the potentially disastrous capture of the state by perverse majorities. No doubt this liberalism in 19th century form was a world away from the romantic dejection of its time. Liberals in that era were still, she wrote, prepared to offer their services to the masses. But after the French Revolution, the frightful character of power itself was lost on no one, and liberals like Lord Acton, who warned of its corruptions, were but a hair's breadth from pessimists like Burkhardt, who denounced power itself as evil. Still, their fears were mild, and they mostly blunted the optimism of enlightenment. The work of 19th century liberalism, rather, was to open the gates of the liberal citadel to conservatism, even if it took Cold War critics of totalitarianism to turn to full-scale capitulation. Though she didn't cite Cold War liberal Isaiah Berlin on this point, perhaps because of personal ties since her graduate days, Schlar viewed an exclusionary focus on negative liberty, liberty as a liberal defect and a liberal asset. And as she made clear, it wasn't in the age of Thomas Hobbes's critique of Republican freedom, nor in the rise of commercial liberty, uh, liberalism on the ruins of civic virtue, but only in the later 19th century, notably in the thought of Herbert Spencer, that liberalism finally redefined freedom in terms of the absence of restraint rather than moral and intellectual self-fulfillment. It was from an unpromising baseline, therefore, that liberalism in the 20th century had to face down not merely totalitarian rule, but also the highly modish Christian and romantic alternatives to it. Liberalism, Schlar wrote, had become only another expression of social fatalism, not an answer to it. To those who lack the aesthetic and subjective urges of the romantic, in her words, or find it difficult to accept formal Christianity, the conservative liberalism of our day offers the opportunity to despair in secular and social fashion. Now, shockingly, I think, in, given the debates of our time, Schlar counted the neoliberal part of Cold War liberalism as her main example of the final abandonment of the Enlightenment by its own children. Almost equally surprisingly, Schlar directed her most complete excoriation of neoliberalism, not at its economic proposals. Instead, she charged it with qualifying and overturning the Enlightenment project in politics. In doing so, she built on a less acute but well-informed bibliographical survey of the new Austro-German Ordo liberalism that her advisor, Carl Friedrich, had authored in the American Political Science Review. Uh, and Schlar followed him in putting Walter Eucken, Friedrich von Hayek, and Wilhelm Lipke in her sights, along with fellow travelers like the libertarian guru Ludwig von Mises and Anglo-American uh, uh, fellow travelers like John Jukes and Michael Polanyi. As interestingly, she interpreted critic of totalitarian democracy, uh, 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 Anglo-Israeli historian Yaakov Talmon, in connection with the neoliberal syndrome she attacked. 
It wasn't to repeat so much its notorious brief against economic planning, let alone its Burkean appreciation for the inarticulate bases of society that made neoliberalism the ally rather than the enemy of Christianity and Romanticism. Rather, it was neoliberalism's larger morose framing as a response to the decline and emergency of Western civilization uh, into a crisis for freedom. Uh, neoliberals, she showed in her pages on the subject, assume deterministically that the Enlightenment leads inexorably to the planning state East and West. And in particular, that Enlightenment intellectualism uh, conduced to enslavement by po uh, popular mania. Uh, so it was that uh, neoliberals like Rübke no longer believed that purposeful social thought and action could do more than usher in the death of freedom. Intellectual life itself, central to the optimism of the Enlightenment and still regarded by 19th century liberals as a source of progress, was now regarded as the wellspring of totalitarianism. That the intellectuals are doomed to ruin society, which is what neoliberals, she thought, believed, is about as extreme a renunciation of the Enlightenment optimism she prized then as she could imagine, yet scandalously. Hayek and Rübke, along with French ex-fascist Bertrand de Juvenel, flirted with this very premise. Worse, Talmon, who was one of the central Cold War liberals, even though he had little dependence on neoliberal economics, illustrated the common extremity of the early neoliberal party's assumption that from enlightenment in politics to totalitarian rule, it is only a short step. Rousseau, uh, Talmon uh, had written, led to Jacobinism, whose democratic rage for a single pattern of action became a standing threat to personal freedom. Schlar drifts scorn on the fact that Talmon, also a Jewish exile, if we're counting, uh, and other neoliberals, most of whom are also Jewish exiles, if, we're, if we care, uh, adopted near Marxian determinism in their explanations of how freedom had to decline uh, in uh, to extinction if democracy remained uh, uh, or were pursued more fully. Not, of course, Schlar insisted that any liberal, self-respecting liberal, should apologize for a concern for personal freedom and limited government. But for Cold War liberals, an inner urge to fatalism has obliterated all distinctions, these are her words, amongst actual forms of government. These approaches abolished all the interesting questions concerning which kinds of regimes were in fact prey to dictatorship, which elite parties declined into single party governance, how precisely the democratic action of cause groups made countries ripe for autocratic backlash. These same questions are highly pertinent on our own moment, I'd add, when we are tempted to conflate every place in the world in a vast emergency for freedom in the face of roving populism. Skipping to the most extreme conclusions about intellectual optimism and government reform, neoliberals adopted the motto, plan and perish, whereby state intervention necessarily greased the slippery slope to absolute control. None of this had happened in the past. Certainly planning had led neither to Adolf Hitler nor Joseph Stalin. But as a frightful premonition of evil, this liberalism of fear she once denounced works similarly within liberalism as other forms of fatalism worked outside it. Now to repeat, none of this meant that the liberal abandonment of enlightenment in her time made it the same as Christian and romantic fatalism. As for the generally warm neoliberal attitude towards Christianity at that time, it just accelerated the older 19th century liberal decision to give religion a second look under pressure. Romantics, however, were not going to hew to 
uh, a gray doctrine like, like neoliberalism. One exception, Hannah Arendt's intellectual master, Karl Jaspers, uh, as Schlar uh, noted numerous times. But her point in doing so uh, wasn't correspondence. Neoliberals like Hayek generally return the favor of romantic allergy to markets by disdaining romantic individuality. Eschlar maintained, uh, even when strange bedfellows made marriages of convenience, it didn't make them identical. But they could all concur in the hopelessness that excluded enlightenment radicalism, which they associated with utmost peril. Now, I'm heading towards the end. It was Schlar's fate to pass away prematurely in 1992, when the Soviet Union had barely disappeared. And a situation for thinking after the long bipolarity of freedom and totalitarianism had only just come about. She only barely outlived the shadow that before consenting to live in Cold War darkness, she had sought, started her career seeking to escape. Not long after the publication of After Utopia, Schlar moved to embrace in this article in 1959 what she called a survivalist approach to political theory. I don't know why she did so. Now in the spirit of Cold War liberalism, Schlar appreciated James Harrington's 17th century thinking for achieving an amoral and a-ideological position that, in her words, rests on the assumption that government cannot make men good but can keep them from violence against one another. She explained, it is a philosophy that is sure to appeal to those who have seen enough of ideological wrangling to last forever. So having struggled to avoid it before, Schlar now drew the consequence that damage control is the lot of those like Harrington in his time, at least on her account, uh, uh, and his Cold War heirs now living amid the detritus of ideological politics and the rubble of grandiose historical expectations should adopt. Indeed, she recorded in this article, the rebirth of survivalism in her own day stood out to her as one of the chief reasons to study the history of political thought. Whatever the value of this stance in the depths and indeed through the end of the Cold War, I believe it represented a retreat on her part. A retreat from her first book, a so far unexplored and even unrecognized one. Now, it wasn't a radical conversion, but her profile before it occurred, I want to conclude by suggesting, is the one that is relevant to us now. Sadly, in fact, uh, Schlar's category in After Utopia, to the extent anyone has read it other than me, uh, have mainly proved appealing to her followers who, even as the Cold War was about to end, and in its immediate aftermath, used her categories to fortify the credentials of a rather conservative liberalism in the face of the communitarians and postmodernists who irked them. In so doing, I think they betrayed the spirit of their source out of loyalty to where Schlar had ended up herself. So take the work of Schlar's follower, Stephen Holmes, where Schlar's category of the romantic proved a useful stigmatizing tool for minor irritants to a late Cold War consensus. Interestingly, at that time, Holmes didn't devote comparable attention to a neoliberalism that has self-evidently proved far more uh, threatening, nor did he seek to revive the category of radicalism uh, in the spirit of enlightenment that had authentic sources in Schlar's thought and might have proved a tonic in the atmosphere of liberal triumphalism and libertarian economics that the end of the Cold War ushered in. Now today, even as a soft authoritarianism lurks in so many countries, not to mention outright tyranny, in places that are far gone. Liberals have generally responded to our crisis by renewing their liberalism of fear, as if it had not already defined their outlook for decades, 
and as if it were the solution rather than the problem. After 1989, when uh, the Cold War ended and liberals missed an opportunity to recover from Cold War liberalism, uh, liberals allowed a vision of their creed to triumph that in practice has allowed marketization and consumption to be proxies for larger agency and social justice. They've ranked liberty above equality and economic above political freedom. Most of all, they failed utterly to reinvent liberalism as an optimistic program for the sake of agency. Integrating its defensible stress on personal freedom in a wider program, such as 19th century liberal theories still try to do, and a mid 20th century liberal practice also allowed. Perhaps it is no wonder that liberals have seemed to find fewer and fewer takers each day. According to its most vociferous critics, liberalism will never overcome the gravitational pull of the freedom of markets for which it has traditionally served as an apology in all of its versions. But perhaps liberalism can break free of the associations it cultivated, not just in the Cold War, but also in our own day for the sake of a more exciting future. If so, Judith Schlar will be remembered not just as a Cold War proponent of the liberalism of fear, but as a prophet of a post-Cold War liberalism of enlightenment and the emancipation and solidarity it once promised the world. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, Samuel Moyne has agreed to take some questions, so we have some time for that. So um, the floor is open. Do you want me to recognize them? Oh, I'm sorry. I, didn't. I was so fixated with the people. Oh. Go ahead. I know you already said during the talk that you don't know why she changes her mind and why she's sort of, why, why there's We can change. speculate. But I, I was wondering, do you have sort of your own speculations about it? Informed speculations, obviously, what you said? No, I, you know, uh, I honestly don't know. I mean, I've thought, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, there could have been personal factors, but actually it's not, you know, uh, that she, you know, got married or had a child. She'd already done so, actually. Uh, she, she finalized the book of which I'm speaking when her, with an infant at home. Larger political factors, I can't, I can't think of anything that would have occurred between circa 56 and circa 58. Um, you know, she wasn't like Arendt, a, a, a devotee of, say, you know, the Hungarian events in 1956. Uh, for very good and, I think, plausible theoretical reasons. Um, but that also meant that she was saved from any kind of crushing disappointment uh, that the, the uh, shipwreck of, you know, East European socialism with a human face, council socialism, whatever, would have involved. So I just don't know. She does have archives, and as you can see, I went there for one day. Um, but uh, it's one of these cases where, you know, not sensing her future importance, at least to a small community of, of cult members, she really didn't keep very much of her correspondence uh, until very late. And she wasn't that well known. So, you know, you find later in her correspondence, um, you know, very interesting letters to and from, uh, you know, Isaiah Berlin and even Quentin Skinner. Uh, but those are decades later. So. It, it, it remains a mystery for me, and I'm open to any speculative hypothesis that you or others may want to offer. Actually, Max was next. Um, thank you for the great talk. Uh, and this question is, I apologize, a little bit unfair. Um, but the Schwar uh, biographical portion seems to end in 1959. And I was wondering uh, if you could comment on how Schwar, if she did react to these forces, 
recognize the enthusiasm of the early 60s the student movement initiatives occurred at the time. Did she have a formal response to uh, movements like SDS? Uh, yeah, generally strongly out of step with student radicalism when it came. Uh, which is not to say she somehow became a, a, a right-wing thinker. Uh, she merely changed the you know, balance of her liberalism and adopted a much greater dose of pessimism than she'd allowed at the beginning. But I think she was quite suspicious of student activism. And you, there are a couple of um, interviews that we have with her, notably the Waltzer one, which is available in the Harvard Library, and, and then famously her um, ACLS uh, Borkhart, different Borkhart lecture called A Life of Learning. And if in one of those she, she records her kind of, you know, distance from student activism, which really didn't hit Harvard very strongly outside of kind of lifestyle issues until 67, 8 and, and, you know, the events around like you know, the draft and conscientious rejection when also a figure like John Rawls kind of woke up to um, some of these things. So I, I think that she, by that point she was set. Uh, now it is true that she for a long time did um, kind of more monographic work. Her second book, um, which is probably my favorite and she explicitly says hers, is called Legalism and I think it's a brilliant uh, account of in the philosophy of law, but then she, you know, she goes back to figures and themes in her first book. She, as I've mentioned, she's covered at least for a, a few pages Rousseau and Hegel before, and then goes on to write famous books about them. Um, but their spirit is different, and I would say um, she, she, I don't find her ever reflecting on the way in which younger people than herself may have, you know been attempting to, you know, unbeknownst to themselves, revive some of the tendencies she'd once prized in the Enlightenment. Right. Um, it's actually, there's a couple before you. So the fifth row in the center. Do you? Yep. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, first of all, um, Do we need microphones? I think um, it's for the camera. Ah, for the camera you need okay. one. Okay. <laughs> a bit too right. loud. Yep. Okay. Like to uh, I'm Gautam. Um, is that it? Or do you want more? <laughs> uh, I'm a D4 student at Oxford, um, working on political theory. But um, so my first question was: uh, Did Judith Clark have anything to say about um, anti-colonial movements either in her own time or the colonial turn of the 19th century, which would seem to be quite central for how liberalism becomes conservative? And my second question, which is probably quite unfair, <laughs> is um, if we are after the Cold War, why, why liberalism? Why not socialism? Good. Okay. Um, now, the, the, the first part was twofold, and I heard the imperial turn, but what, what was the first? Uh, it's an anti-colonial Oh, anti-colonial. No. So this is, of course, quite interesting how badly... Um, I mentioned this briefly, kind of the canon of political theory really even registered that there was decolonization. Uh, a famous counterexample would be Hannah Arendt's On Violence, uh, which is bitterly critical of, of mainly actually of Jean-Paul Sartre's preface to Frantz Fanon. Um, to the best of my knowledge, and I'm happy to be, to stand corrected, Schlar never mentioned it. And of course, she, you know, in her defense, she lived before, you know, current scholarly priorities. Um, and there was almost no one with the exception of someone like Melvin Richter, who was interested in the imperial uh, politics of classic 19th century liberals. So it, it, as far as I can recall, she doesn't mention them, nor Burke's before them, you know, his more critical attitude towards empire. Um, now, it depends on what you mean by socialism. Um, so I've, I've put out a possibility that, you know, um, in, in the face of, of a much more Marxified youth than was true in recent generations, including my own, um, liberals want to explore the resources of their tradition. But non-liberals may not 
want to bother doing so. Uh, and uh, then we will fight. So over this side was the next, uh, <coughs> the, yeah, in the penultimate row. I don't, do you want to wait until the microphone? Is there someone running to you with a microphone? Um, and uh, yeah, it'd be good if you could say your name and affiliation. Yes, um, I'm Emily. I'm, from, I'm a PhD student here at Queen Mary. And I work on the Frankfurt School, so this is slightly related um, because I realized that the way the Frankfurt School, Adorno and Horkheimer do think about liberalism in the 50s is actually quite similar to, to the way she does, or there are certain similarities. And I was wondering, because I mean, the dialectic of enlightenment, of course, goes back to antiquity, actually. Popper also goes back um, to then. Um, what is her longer sort of historical, the way she, she frames her narrative? Does she really only go back to the enlightenment, like enlightenment proper with a capital E? Does she go um, back further? Does she also think about then, sort of into the future, does she think about positivism, technology, sort of Weber's iron cage of modernity, and when she thinks about sort of the end of utopia and the, and the way how the system becomes corrupted? Uh, fantastic questions. Um, mm -hmm. I think that had she known about the Frankfurt School, she would have had very good material for her book, as at least as she might well have understood it. Because um, her story about neoliberals and others is that they in fact represent the abandonment of enlightenment by its own heirs. Uh, and of course, <coughs> it's famous to criticize, especially when it comes to the book you mentioned, uh, the Frankfurt School for its you know, pessimistic abandonment of enlightenment uh, with, with the, you know, path, the, the kind of parting uh, and, and unconvincing proviso that someday, not ours, uh, you know, the messages in a bottle we're sending out uh, through various kinds of difficult art will reach some unknown uh, destination and, and allow for a utopia unavailable to us. Uh, and of course, within that same tradition, a figure like Jürgen Habermas has attacked the dialect of enlightenment on precisely these grounds. So I, you know, not that I'm a big fan of his, but his diagnosis of the early Frankfurt School is very reminiscent of her diagnosis of Cold War political theory in general. But she knew what she knew. I mean, for an American, you know, and I say this with full awareness of our general parochialism, she knew an extraordinary amount about um, European political thought of her time. It's just that at that moment, the Frankfurt School was composed of a bunch of ciphers whom these 68ers popularized. Uh, it really would not have been fair to ask her to know that in the face of the really pertinent authors of that moment who are chock full uh, of interesting things that she covers. Um, I think that um, it is fairer to indict her for um, missing any account of technology. She was so, she found a figure like Martin Heidegger so abhorrent not to really look into his later thought. Uh, so in, in, you know, I, 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 she, she gives very brief critiques in a short book and I've then telescoped them further. but. I, I gave just the very briefest critique of, of a, a, a summary of her critique of being in time uh, and its doctrine of mid sign and so forth. But then later, she, she doesn't seem to have followed his thought uh, and known of you know, the turn and the you know, question concerning technology and all that, uh, or the broader Marxist um, concern about technology. So it's, again, it's an omission and it's, a, it's surprising because there was a discourse about it at that time, Jacques Ellul and so forth and so on. Great. Um, this, we'll have a couple more, but next is in the third row, if you can get the microphone there. Yeah. And then you'll be the last question then. Okay. Which one is the next one? It's the, the gentleman with the blue jumper in the middle. There you go. Thank you. Lucy Bailey, BBC World Service um, Radio, and I'm a journalist, so forgive me for asking a couple of questions about today. Um, the first is, how significant and enduringly influential is Schlar's thought today, 
And the second one is, um, you say liberals missed an opportunity to recover from the Cold War um, liberalism after 1989. Um, what's holding back liberals today from reclaiming, rediscovering a more radical liberalism? Those are both terrific questions. I mean, those of us who work in this area, you know, are kind of narrow academics. Um, many know Sklar and think her important. Uh, but she was unlike, I think, um, at least some of the others I mentioned. She never sought much of a public audience. Uh, she never published with a, you know, a trade press, as we would call it today. She occasionally wrote for, you know, wide circulation magazines, uh, like the New Republic. She wrote a couple of times for the London Review of Books. But um, she was even in her time, a kind of cult figure for those, especially those who encountered her, uh, like Professor Stedman Jones, uh, either at Harvard or on one of her English uh, trips. Um, I didn't encounter her. I just think her books are very good. Um, but that's within a narrow academic space. I think she uh, represents a much broader uh, climate of opinion uh, in her time. Uh, once she becomes the kind of Cold War liberal that she mostly was. Um, today, I think, I mean, I would offer the, the very debatable argument that um, in the face of a, a, a kind of crisis uh, of liberalism in, you know, in, in what's conventionally called a populist moment, most liberals, as I said, have thought it's an emergency for freedom uh, democracy is apt to die, tyranny looms, uh, uh, and the people are at war against the democratic order, uh, even though democracy is supposed to be the rule of the people. So I've just given you like the titles of three popular books um, that take this stance. And, you know, I think from the perspective of the early Schlar and from mine, this is not remedial, and it mistakes, it's a, it's a symptomatic politics of not understanding that the cure on offer um, has been a source of the disease. Uh, and so uh, uh, what, would, what it would take to get liberals to embrace a wider doctrine gets us into very contested territory. You know, are people operating under you know, their own power and, you know, can they develop their own intellectual proposals to change the world or are they serve servants of class interest? What I find heartening about Schlar's early views is that as a child of enlightenment, she thought we could not only change the world, but we could and had to think to do so. Many people today would say, especially in so far as they're Marxian socialists, that liberals are just apologists for neoliberal capitalism and therefore they can't change. They're slaves of uh, larger forces. And if that's true, then we face very interesting times. And even if uh, it's not true, we might be able to muster some support for a reorientation of liberalism uh, in the future. And finally, Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. My name's David Klemper. I'm an MPhil student in political thought at the University of Cambridge. Uh, the Cold War liberals that Schlar is attacking often base their ideas on an interpretation, as you've said, of the French Revolution, yes. and in particular the Jacobin Terror, people like exactly. Talman. And of course you've noted that Schlar sees the origins of conservative liberalism in responses to the Jacobin Terror. That's right. So my question is, in her attempt to rescue the Enlightenment, how does she explain the Jacobin terror? What was her interpretation of the French Revolution? Good. And how does Good. she get around the obvious consequences that happened in trying to rescue that project? Good. That's a brilliant question, and, and, and it points to an, an omission, you know, in, in a 20-year-old's book, you know, 20-odd-year-old. Um, it would seem that she would have to have an account of, of let's call it the contingency of uh, of, of, of Jacobinism, assuming Jacobinism was, was in some respects mistaken. Uh, you know, we might revisit that premise. Um, and yet she doesn't give such an account. Now she does give an account of Cold War liberal fatalism that you might think 
gives us clues to how she, one might think or how she might have thought about, uh, about, uh, uh, about Jacobinism. So her critique of, of, of the um, doctrine of totalitarian rule is that it's homogenizing, it blames ideas, and it adopts an almost deterministic understanding of why political evil accrues. Uh, actually, all of these views were later applied to the French Revolution, not just by this predecessor, Talmon, but by François Furet in our time, and in his quest to destroy the, the you know, previously dominant Marxian interpretation of the French Revolution. I think she would reject both in the name of something like a social democratic interpretation, uh, neither anti-totalitarian nor Marxian, and argue that what happened to Jacobinism was very contingent. I mean, the old regime did declare war on these people. And there, there were lots of other contingencies. It's not as if they were driven by the very logic of the Enlightenment, as Furet claimed following Talmon, although independently, uh, or uh, by the very idea of democracy to descend into terror, which we had, you know, much sort of minor incidents compared to what you may have heard in any, in any case. So I believe she would make an argument that we focus on context and contingency, which then means that the Enlightenment ideal need not be associated necessarily with the contingent outcomes of one context. Well, um, do let's all continue this conversation outside. You're all invited to a reception, which is just through in the main foyer. Um, but before we do that, please join me in thanking Sal Moyne for a really terrific uh, lecture. Thanks very much.